Let's open the scriptures to 1 Timothy. But before we get into the text, you no doubt do not need a reminding of the um, physically demanding and spiritually encouraging and theologically challenging weekend that we had last weekend. I myself feel like a little rowboat. I've been in one of those a few times over the years. Rocking around in the wake of a super tanker that has just gone past. And, um, but anyway, life must go on. And so we press on here in the um, pulpit. I am not getting anything uh, coming up here. Okay, there we have it. We do have things coming up. And um, as you know, we've finished a series on the Ten Commandments. And what I wish to do now is start on a series on First Timothy and God willing, moving on into Second Timothy. And this, these two letters were written by the Apostle Paul to this younger pastor at the church at a city called Ephesus. But before I begin my introduction, I think it's important to grasp right at the outset what Paul's overall purpose is and was in writing this epistle. I'm a great believer in sort of, um, you know, when I, even when I come to the scriptures, I find it a great help to read the help of expositors and translations, you know, that bit in the front where you can read the theme and when it was written, uh, written and, and, and the, the action that was going around, they read the context, and so that really helps you understand. But here we have in the text the overall purpose of this letter, and it is found in chapter 3, verse 15. I'll put it up on the screen for you. Here Paul tells it clearly, and he says, I write so that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. That's the overall purpose statement, if you want to put it that way, uh, of this epistle. Now, there is a whole lot of truth in this verse, and uh, we will deal with it when we get there. But let us all lock this away and see it as Paul's big picture statement, purpose statement for this letter of Timothy, because it will help you kind of gather everything together and to see where Paul is coming, on, coming from uh, in his instruction to Timothy. Because if you keep this in mind, it will help you when we contrast the true gospel with the counterfeit gospels in chapter 1 of this epistle. It will help you understand as Paul instructs about prayer and public worship in chapter 2 of this epistle. It will also help you understand when we consider apostasy and its remedy in chapter 4. And also how he instructs on how to treat older people and widows and eldership in chapter 5. And then, of course, it will help us to understand how we should handle conflict, wealth, and contentment in chapter 6. It kind of pulls it all together and puts a proper perspective on it if we hold that purpose statement in view. As the Apostle Paul's two letters to Timothy and his letter to Titus, they are often called, as you know, Alex is taking us through this, one of them... These three epistles are often called the pastoral epistles. And so here is Paul writing to his protege, his spiritual son, as he calls him. Timothy was Paul's most cherished pupil in all of his ministry. It's a letter from one man in the ministry to another, hence we call it a pastoral epistle. This is appropriate in one sense because these letters were written to young pastors who were involved in the leadership of churches, hence its appropriateness. And so often these three letters are viewed as a kind of a, a handbook for pastors or those in leadership in the church, and rightly so. Yet as we will see, 
Much of the material in these epistles is designed for the communities that these men are pastoring in themselves. Much of the material. So with this in mind, I would like you to understand these public or these epistles as, as simulated public epistles, if you will. Even though they're written to individuals, they are written to the community at large. With that in mind, I would like to view these letters as intimate letters of instruction, not only to leaders, but to, past, but to believers, all believers. Another aspect of the personal yet public touch of these letters is Paul's, is Paul's spiritual relationship. He has a spiritual relationship with Timothy and Titus because they were both saved under his ministry. Hence, he lovingly refers to them as my true child in the faith. You have that in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, and you have it in Titus 1, verse 4. And so he refers to them lovingly as his true ch children in the faith. And looking at the wider implication, if you just hold that there for a while, looking at the wider implication of this, we must agree that every believer, everyone here that is truly born again, um, there is some human element in your spiritual birth, although be it unknown to some. Because humanly speaking, our personal salvation can be attributed to someone's faithful testimony, or maybe someone's prayers, or maybe someone's preaching, or someone's witness in the gospel. My brother and I were talking about this over the weekend, and, and I think I just heard the, uh, the question being asked since then by someone, you know, why me? Why would the Lord choose me? I'm the only one in my family that is saved, this person was telling me. And my brother and Russell were talking about the same thing. And, and, and he says, look at a lot, many of our contemporaries that we grew up with in church are nowhere spiritually now. So why us, Jeff? And then we started sort of throwing out ideas. And one of the things that we came to, and we're not saying this is what it was, but we had a, a when we were growing up as boys, our room was right next to mum and dad's. And one of the things we remember and will never be pushed out of our memory, every night we could hear this low rumble of monotone voices where mum and dad were down on their knees and praying. And it came through the thin walls and we heard them mumbling. And we went to sleep with that every night. And so Russell and I said, was it mum and dad's prayers that moved God to save us? I don't know. But it certainly was important. And so that's how God sovereignly brings about his saving purposes in the gospel, right? That's how he does that. He uses people who obey the command that he gave his disciples before his ascension. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, Matthew 28, 19. That reminds us that God's mission for his children is to spiritually reproduce others in the life of others, or spiritually reproduce ourselves in the life of others. We're to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And that's what happened here between Paul and Timothy. Here Paul gives testimony of him being God's instrument used to reproduce a spiritual son in leading Timothy to faith. Folks, this should remind us that we who are God's children are also in the spiritual reproduction business, can I say. And also we ourselves need to be indebted to the faithful witness of God's instrument in our own lives. This is why you parents and you grandparents out there, you as a first priority, you need to be praying and much in prayer to God for those who come under your umbrella, your children, and your family, etc., etc. And I know many of you are. So let's not get bogged down here with these pastoral epistles as only being for pastors and church leaders. These letters are inspired words of God for all the children of God so that we might bring glory to God in and through the local church. And so right at the outset, we will see how all the children of God are saved to serve. 
him in the gospel. We're saved to serve. But we first need to find a little more about this Timothy and Paul before we start digging into the text. And by the way, most of my message this morning is by way of introduction. And um, God willing, I will say, have a few comments on verses 1 and 2 uh, toward the end. And I'll start with this illustration. I know many of you at times in life, you have taken on different tasks. Or, or maybe you have begun a career. Or you've taken and seen an opportunity that has presented itself to you and you've entered into that opportunity. Or maybe you've decided, I want to take up a particular line of study at university or whatever, or in some discipline. And when you first start, you know what it's like? It's all so good, right? It's exciting. Yeah, I love this. The people are nice. The job in hand is new and it's interesting. And the days, they go so quick. But it's often the case that before long, all becomes very ordinary. The gloss loses its shine. People become prickly. The task becomes more demanding. The days drag on. You kind of hit a wall, as it were. And you're not even sure whether you want to carry on with your first started, even though it was so good when you first started. You been there? You know, it could be like that in ministry as well. You jump in boots and all. You're full of enthusiasm and you give your all and extra. The potential of seeing something great happen is really compelling you and it motivates you. You believe your gifts and abilities are ideally suited for the ministry at hand and the task ahead. But then the gloss loses its shine. It becomes hard. You find yourself overwhelmed with inadequacy as you face situations way beyond your gift and abilities. You thought everyone would carry on being nice and continue to like you, but they don't usually because of some petty reason. You, th- you thought serving the Lord would be kind of fun and exciting, but you discover it's hard and difficult. As a matter of fact, it's an ongoing battle. Folks, this is where Timothy was when Paul wrote this letter to him. This is where he was. But let's dig a little further so that we can understand this man and where he was coming from and what made him tick, okay? He was a teenager in a home with a pagan father and a Jewish mother. That was his heritage. But praise God, he had a mother and a grandmother that taught him the Scriptures. We read that in 2 Timothy 3.15, and we know that he had a pagan father and a Jewish mother from Acts 16, verse 1. But even though he had a mother and a grandmother that taught him about God from the Scriptures, he did not know that Jesus was the promised Messiah until a rabbi, Paul, the preacher of the gospel, came to town one day. And Timothy was saved at that time through Paul's preaching. This was Paul's first missionary journey. And he came to this town of Lystra. And after Paul preached the gospel there at Lystra, he then healed the lame man. And really, that cemented his words into place, right? The trouble is the people of Lystra got carried away and in their enthusiasm then began worshipping them or wanting to worship them and bring sacrifices and all things. And they wanted to treat them as gods with a little g. He quelled that very quickly, him and Barnabas did. People are so fickle because soon after those same people who were trying to treat them as gods took him out of town and stoned him and left him for dead. We read that in Acts 14. But amazingly, Paul got up from his traumatic experience of being rocked on and he courageously returned to the city. Imagine that. 
Jordan brought this to my attention when we were going through the book of Acts a long time ago. Imagine that, being stoned and left for dead and hated and despised. And here he gets up and he goes back to the city. And this is what he said. This is what uh, this is what it says there to strengthen the souls of the disciples. That's what he got up and went. He went to strengthen the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying, "Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God." Acts sixteen. You see, Timothy was one of those in Lystra who had believed. Timothy was one of those who Paul went back to strengthen and encouraged to continue on in the faith. In the years that followed, Timothy grew in the Lord. And not only that, he was highly regarded by the local church for his ministry among them. We read that in Acts chapter 16 and verse 2. And I love that. He was a pastoral intern doing what he was meant to be doing. He was learning and he was growing and he was loved by the people. And then the Apostle Paul came through town again. This is on a second ministry journey, by the way. And this time he wanted to formulate a team and guess who he goes to? I want Timothy to join my team. I want Timothy to join me in my itinerant preaching ministry. Acts 16 verse 3. Imagine that, the greatest fearless preacher of the gospel, the apostle. What an opportunity to travel and serve with this courageous man of God who had led him to faith in Christ. Timothy would have been on tippy toes. A little bit like C.H. Spurgeon maybe, or Jonathan Edwards or D.L. Moody, calling you out to join them up to further the kingdom and the preaching ministry. What an honor. Well, Timothy would have been in his early 20s, possibly at this time, and Paul near 50 years of age in his prime. And for about the next 18 years, until Paul was beheaded by Nero, Timothy served with Paul as a devoted son would serve his father. 18 years. If we went to the book of Acts, you would see that Paul is there in prison. He's in house arrest. This first imprisonment of Paul's was a reasonable one. You know, it wasn't down in the dungeon. It was in his own quarters. And he he had certain amounts of freedom and people could come and go and he pre preached the gospel, but he had to stay within confines. We have those sort of things now, you know. People are let out of jail, but they've got to stay at home. But he was Paul under house arrest. And by the way, this is where, when he was under house arrest, that Paul wrote the prison epistles, as we call them. He wrote Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. And all the time, Timothy remained with Paul. We see that in Philippians 1.1 1, 1 and Colossians 1.1. 1, 1. But it was time for Paul to hit the road again after his release. And that's what he did. And they went and visited churches that they had ministered in before. And one of the churches was the church at Ephesus. If you ever get the chance, an opportunity to go to Turkey, go and see Ephesus. Some of you have already been there. They're wonderful ruins. Even though they're ruins, they're wonderful to wander through and pick up. We even went out into the fields and I was able to pick up bits of potsherd. They plowed up. But there's a wonderful theatre there that we read of in Scripture where Paul went. It's a great place to go in modern Turkey on the coast. Well, this is where Paul and Timothy came. And Paul knew the city and this church very well in the city, by the way. He had once been there on an early occasion, and it was through his ministry that he caused an uproar. Fancy causing an uproar in a city. 
Well, that's what Paul did, you know, because so many people were coming to the Lord and these pagan people who once worshipped gods where they used to wear and have in their homes uh, their idols made of silver, etc., etc. All of a sudden, all their books were being burnt and all their idols were being trashed and, and, the, and the local pagan idol seller was doing it tough because his monetary uh, funds were getting low and so the silversmiths, fired up a uproar in the city, a riot, basically, and they all ended up in the theatre. And the cry went up, Great is the is Artemis of the Ephesians, their God. So he caused an uproar. So he knew the city very well. But as it was, Paul also started a Bible school in that city. He started a Bible school and, and he taught for two years Believers in that Bible school. So he knew Ephesus pretty well. Even though he never planted the church, we believe probably Barnabas did, but Paul knew the city well. Acts 19 verse 10 tells us of that Bible school. But here is Paul again with Timothy. But you know what? Paul this time could not stay. Paul needed to leave and go to Macedonia. And so he leaves now. Timothy, to deal with the issues that were going on at the church at the time. And this is what we read in 1 Timothy, verse 3. And while in Macedonia, sometime between the late 62 and nearly early 64, news must have got back to the Apostle Paul that the ministry in Ephesus was not going well. It was under pressure, and Timothy was really sagging under the heat of it all. This is where the news got back to Paul. So Paul wrote 1 Timothy to his younger co-worker to encourage him and give him apostolic instruction on how church life was to be. And this reminds us of the purpose statement. So serving Christ alongside the Apostle Paul sounds wonderful and exciting, but it wasn't idyllic. Paul's early message, though many tribulations, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. It was proving all too true in regards to Timothy. Timothy often felt like he was in way over his head. He was weighed down and he felt increasingly inadequate for the task at hand. He was this timid and shy man, because that's what his personality was. He was timid and shy. And when conflict arose, Timothy did not want to be there. He would rather back off. 2 Timothy chapter 1 tells us something of that. Yet here was Timothy. He found himself smack in the middle of it all. He was it. Many times he felt like quitting. And this was one of those times. New Testament church, like, like many other New Testament church, was far from perfect, as some might like to think. And here was Timothy also living in this town that was rife with sexual immorality, occult practices, and different worldviews, and the sins of the culture, folks, found its way into the church. This, of course, had a weakening effect on the church in what should have been a bastion and a pillar in the community of God's truth. And as often happens in such environments, Ephesus became plagued by false teachers and their teachings. Timothy's task is summed up in these first few verses. Let us read First Timothy so that we can grab some of this. First Timothy, we'll begin at verse 1. And just for the sake of context, I'll read down to end of verse 11, if you have your Bibles there. We'll read of Timothy's task, because it's summed up in verse 3 and 4. Pay attention to that, but we'll read right down to the end of verse 11. 
Verse 1 says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, as I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may instruct certain men not to treat, teach strange doctrines nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which give rise to mere speculation rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. But the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. For some men straying from these things have turned aside to fruitless discussion, wanting to be teachers of the law, even though they do not understand either what they are saying or the matters about which they make confident assertions. But we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully, realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers and for immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel of uh, the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. May God add a blessing to his word. So there, right at the outset, we see Timothy's task is summed up in verse 3 and 4. Remain on at Ephesus in order that you may instruct. That literally means command certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor pay attention to myths and endless genealogies. Now on the surface, that sounds pretty simple, right? Just give it to them straight. Tell them not to do that. But as you can imagine, people who are nurtured and caught up in different worldviews and ideologies and strange doctrines do not just dump them overnight. In fact, people get uptight and emotional when such things are challenged. They even feel threatened and take it very personally. Well, this was Timothy's job. This was his ministry. This is what he was to do. I wonder if you're getting a picture here. Here is this timid, shy, peace-loving, ordinary man who finds himself in a church where men were teaching strange and false doctrine and it was Timothy's job to confront them and their followers. And you know what? And false teachers love to gain followers. I can hear these deluded followers and their false teachers saying, who does this young upstart think he is telling us that we're wrong? So Paul wrote this letter to encourage and bolster Timothy in this false teacher infected church. And so as we have seen the overall purpose of this book in 315, there is also a single message, can I say, summed up in the book as well. Right throughout, there is this guard, the deposit of sound doctrine. It's an ongoing message right throughout this book. All the way through his letter, Paul's message of depositing or entrusting, as we have in verse 18, the truth of God to Timothy in order that he would faithfully use it in Ephesus is of great importance. That's the message. He does not say, Timothy, you stay on there and you just keep your head down. You enjoy the position. You make sure you protect your pastoral responsibility there. Don't fight back. Don't fight back. And you will find that everything will smooth out and she'll be okay. He doesn't say that. You get, go down to verse 18, you know what he says? Exactly opposite. Fight the good fight. Fight the good fight. He says in chapter 6, right at the end of this letter, O Timothy, guard what has been entrusted or deposited to you. There it is again, the message. This doctrine that had been given to him, this teaching, this true teaching, he is to guard it and use it in the fight. So to wrap up our introduction, 
how to conduct yourself in the house of the God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of truth. That's the theme, right? That's the theme. That's the purpose statement. And guarding the truth of God that has been deposited into Timothy's account, and can I say here, that has been deposited into your account, that you have been given, all those who have been saved. That's the message. It's important. So with that, let's briefly look at a couple of lessons now that we can learn from these first two verses. The first one is believers are saved to serve. Okay? Believers are saved to serve God. Right at the outset, we see if we look in our text, Paul introduces himself to Timothy. Now, if you were writing a letter, we would probably start, uh, we would probably start with verse 2, if we were even, um, rather than verse 1 at the beginning. We would say, to Timothy, and end what, what Paul says in verse 1. But Paul begins with his name alongside a descriptive title of his calling, as well as telling us that he is a man who is under orders. You see that? He's telling Timothy that he's a man under orders. It says, according to the commandment of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus, who is our hope. He identifies himself as an apostle of Christ Jesus, according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now, there is one main, main lesson I wish to highlight for you uh, here, and that Paul was under orders. Whose orders? They were orders according to the commandment of God our Savior and Christ Jesus. And it is only right that we as believers... Believers in the same Christ Jesus, the same God, our Savior, understand that we're under orders as well. Okay? We are under orders as well. This would have been a powerful reminder to Timothy also of his mission. Right at the outset, he would have been given a jolt here. You know, to have Paul use his full apostolic title, he doesn't always do that in his, in his letters to churches and to, and to others, but he here is using his full apostolic title. This would have challenged Timothy to stay the course, but it also would have strengthened his hand in his ministry to the people of Ephesus. You see, although things were tough, Timothy was thinking, would have been thinking, although the ministry was bigger than him, although his feelings of inadequacy were real, he was still a man, just like Paul, a man under orders. Orders from God and Savior Christ Jesus, just as the mighty apostle was under his orders as well. The lesson here should not be lost on all of it, any of us. God has saved us so that we might serve him. That's pretty simple, right? Serve him as men and willing, men and women who are willing to obey God our Savior. Now, that's an interesting title, God our Saviour. I don't know if you noted that, but it's worth a deeper look. Not a Saviour, but our Saviour. It's real personal here. Paul uses this unusual, it is an unusual phrase, unusual because it's used six times in the pastoral epistles and nowhere else in Paul's writings. And so what this highlights is that the foundation of any service we render to God must be based on the truth that God has saved us. That God is our Savior. The idea of God as our Savior is rooted in the Old Testament, of course. And we will see that over and over in the Old Testament. But more significantly, we see this when we come to the New Testament where Jesus is designated as Savior. And we all know that well. We go to Luke 2 and 11. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. So what this title in 1 Timothy shows us is that Jesus is God. His very name means Yahweh saves. The angel explained to Joseph that the reason for naming the child in Mary's womb Jesus is that he would, what? 
save his people from their sins. Jesus is a personal. He's our Savior. Historically, it has been suggested by different commentaries or commentators, the reason why Paul uses God our Savior in the pastorals at this time in history is that Emperor Nero, evidently Emperor Nero, who was a, a vicious, wicked man, took on himself the title of Savior of the world. So Paul, in using this phrase, is saying, no, Nero, you are not Savior, for only God can save. Folks, has God saved you? You all need to answer that question, honestly, before God. Has God saved you? Are you saved from God's just wrath against your sin? Saved from sin's wages, which is death and hell? Saved from wasting your life in the here and now? This needs to be asked because our proud hearts will be just like Nero. We'll justify any religious affiliation, any good works that we might involve ourselves in. We will justify any self-sacrifice that we might make as being what will save us in the place of God alone. But the message of the cross is very different to that, right? The message of the cross of Jesus Christ, it, it crushes human pride by stating... 1 Corinthians 1.29, no flesh shall, be, shall boast before God. The gospel message is not, is, if your life lacks fulfillment, if you're having a few problems in your life, try Jesus. That is not the gospel message. The gospel message apart, is apart from Christ, you are lost, you are perishing, you are under God's judgment, and that you cannot save yourself. That's the gospel message. See, God does not save any who are worthy because none are worthy. Even Jesus said that. There are none, there is no, there's no one who is good. But in His grace, God does save unworthy sinners who take refuge in Jesus and His shed blood on the cross. That's the gospel. He does save unworthy sinners. So the message to any here who might not know God as their own personal saviour? Trust in him. That's the message. Trust in him. You know, one of my greatest concerns in the ministry, and I'm sure it's many of you here too, is that there can be people in the church, in, the min in ministry or whatever, people who are serving God or think they are in some way or fashion who have not first been saved by God. That, that is a frightening thing to me. My fear is that there may be some who serve God and attempt to earn his favor, like Paul did, by the way. Remember Paul when he was called Saul? He was like that. He was enthusiastic and he was zealous for God of the Old Testament scriptures, but he did not know God as his personal savior. Make sure that God is truly your savior. Then you can serve him. We are truly saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, are all under orders to obey God's call. We have been saved to serve in the gospel of Jesus Christ. There, are, that's pretty simple. Well, why can we have confidence in this call? Simply this, because who is Jesus Christ? He's our hope, right? That's what it says in the text. He's our hope. See that? When we think about hope, it's, it's, it's not a, a hope in religion. It's not a hope in other human beings of some political nature. It's not even a hope for a better world. But our hope is, as the hymn writer of old says, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Christ Jesus himself is our hope. Amen? Biblical hope is... Not an uncertain wish for a better tomorrow. No. Biblical hope is certain, though unseen, though unseen, 
it will give way to sight in the coming day. It is certain because our hope rests on what? It rests on the tangible, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he is our hope. Because he he arose and ascended to heaven, we will arise and ascend to heaven. Our hope believes in the reigning Christ, the one who is now seated at God's right hand, the one who is far above all rule and authority, Ephesians 1 verse 20 to 23. Our hope waits for the promised returning Christ who will come again. That's our hope. My dear people, we are under orders to serve God, our Saviour, and of Christ Jesus, our hope. Just briefly now, I want to highlight a second lesson from verse 2. And this emphasises Timothy and Paul's true child in the faith, which shows us that the goal of our service is to reproduce ourselves spiritually, as Paul had done with Timothy, which I mentioned before. And so... Our second one is that the aim of our service is to make disciples or true children in the faith. We see this in verse 2. See, Paul dresses Timothy as his true child in the faith. A a, a wonderful term of endearment there, but it's more than that. It has a uh, a theological premise and a foundation uh, deeply attached to it. This means that Timothy had true saving faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ that was preached by Paul. It's a wonderful thing to lead someone to Christ. It's a wonderful thing. And here was Paul rejoicing in someone who he had led to Christ through his preaching. And he then calls him my true son in the faith, just as he does also with Titus. And he no doubt could have with many others. But Timothy was special. He was one who stuck to him. 18 years he walked with him. And so Paul is setting up Timothy as an example of what a true child in the faith really looks like, as we will discover as we go through this first epistle. You want to know what a true child in the faith looks like? You want to know what a new convert looks like? Just take a look at Timothy, Paul is saying. You see, genuine faith is always authenticated. And it was definitely authenticated. It was definitely verified in Timothy. How was it verified? By his continuing obedience, by his humble service, and the sound doctrine he held to and preached. Even though he sagged at times, and we all sag, right? Even though he weakened under the pressure and was timid and shy, he verified and authenticated what a true believer looks like. And Paul was not ashamed to hold him up here as an example. Paul, on another occasion, was really concerned for some Corinthian churches who weren't veri- uh, uh, ch- Christians who weren't uh, verifying their, their faith, and, and that was the Corinthian church. There were obviously some in the Corinthian church who weren't showing any evidence or authenticating what true faith looked like. And so he challenges them in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, and he says, test yourselves or examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. So that was a concern for Paul as well. And here he holds Timothy up as, take a look at this guy. This is what genuine faith really looks like. And so it seems that there were those here in the Ephesus church who may not have been true children in the faith as well, just like Paul suspected in the Corinthian church. Some may have been questioning the deity of Jesus Christ, And by the way, one who rejects the deity of Jesus Christ is not saved. You got that? You you might say, how can you be so dogmatic? I can be dogmatic because this is what the Word of God says. Look what Jesus said in John 8, 24. Unless you believe that, here it is, I am. That's another I am you haven't heard of yet. Unless you believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. That's pretty clear. So the next time a Jehovah's Witness comes around and knocks on your door and they do not believe that Jesus is God, you can tell them you're on the way to hell. Take them to John 8, 24. Paul's mission now is to make disciples and that is to reproduce 
not followers of a church, not followers of a doctrine, not even associates in the ministry. But we're not called to, to, to make followers of that. We are under orders from God our Savior of Jesus, and Jesus, of Jesus Christ to sow the seed of the gospel that reproduces in others what God and grace has done in us. That's the picture. That's the story. We're called to serve in producing true children of the faith. Do you know God is your Savior? If not, do not rest, folks, until you do. If so, great. Then understand that he has saved you to serve him. The aim of that service is to bring glory to God by you becoming his true child in the faith and by you bringing others to become his true children in the faith, as Paul did to and with Timothy. I'll leave you with a short story I read about it in my uh, research here. And it's about the great preacher, uh, preacher D.L. Moody. If you haven't heard of D.L. Moody, you need to do some reading and look at some of our heroes of the faith. Many of you will know of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was an uneducated shoemaker whom God saved. And a man named Reynolds told about the first time he ever saw D.L. Moody, way before D.L. Moody became famous, can we say. And the story is this. Moody was in a little shack that had been abandoned by a saloon keeper and here he was holding a small black boy in his arms, reading to him the story of the prodigal son. Moody couldn't even read all the words, so he had to skip many of them. Reynolds thought, if God can ever use such an instrument as that for his honor and glory, it will certainly astonish me. Yet we all know how God used D.L. Moody. He can use you, and he can use me that way, just as he used shy, timid Timothy. We're saved to serve, folks. Shall we pray? Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we bow before you, acknowledging that we are unworthy, unworthy vessels, and yet, Lord, you have saved us and we have learned from these two small verses that we're not here just to skip through life and enjoy ourselves and be consumed with selfish living. We've been saved to serve you. Well, Father, whether it be in the home, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in and through the church, Wherever and whatever, Lord, use us, we pray. Give us hearts that are willing, even though the task may seem way beyond us. Help us speak for you. Help us to serve you. Because, Father, we are called, we're under orders to make disciples. And so, Lord, may we be those who know what it is to be sanctified, set apart, so that we may be worthy vessels of honor, that are fit to emulate by others. Help us to be examples of what it is to be a true child in the faith. And so, Father, we commit ourselves to you and ask that you would bless us and watch over us and protect us in the coming week. We ask these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen.